Okay, so good evening, guys. So welcome back. So we are going to continue our discussion on Linux, and today is uh, day four, day five session. Sorry, day five, right? Day five session, and the date is twenty seventh of July, and the timing is eight thirty seven p.m. IST. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, guys, yesterday we had uh, started our uh, started discussing on Linux, right? So that's what we started, and we try to understand what exactly an operating system is all about, right? And and also the different subsystem of your operating system, right? And basically, we call uh, operating system as a kernel itself, right? Because ninety five percent of the code of the operating system we call it as a kernel. So the main core of your operating system, the main core of the operating system of OS is kernel. So in Linux or Unix, we always say it as a kernel, Linux kernel or just say kernel, right? And we also understood that what are those five subsystem of the kernel and also uh, one line information about each and every subsystem of the kernel. Right. So Linux uh, is like, as I said, Linux is like a Unix operating system. Right. So guys, what happened in 1970s or in 1975, you, very early in early 1970s, right? You know that there was one organization by name AT&T. Even today also we have AT&T. So we had an AT&T company and AT&T has its own lab. We call it AT&T Labs. Right. Even we had some other labs like Bell Labs. And there is one university, I think you might have heard about Berkeley software or Berkeley uh, University. And this Berkeley University had its own uh, distribution they call BSD, Berkeley Software Distribution, we say. Now, during this 1970s, right, when people, a lot of scientists and great people were working, uh, working on developing an operating system, right? So a lot of people during that time, like uh, Joseph Osana, Joseph Morris, Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, right, uh, Bill Joy, there were a lot of people who were part of this at t lab and they were working on a development of the project, right? So during that time, what happened? A lot of big companies, other big chain companies like IBM, HP company, Xerox company, uh, you know, like HP company, a lot of companies had even contributed a lot of money for the developing a new operating system. Okay, so so what happened, right? In the year 1974, in the year 1974, so Major Lincoln Thompson, who is a main contributor of your uh, Unix operating system, so he's a main guy who actually designed the whole Unix operating system, right? And uh, Ken Thompson is the same pa pa guy who designed the B language. I'm not sure whether how many know he is a guy who designed this P language. So what he did, right, Ken Thompson, he had wrote the whole Unix operating system code by using the B language. But B language has a lot of limitations. The one major limitation was that it doesn't have the concept of pointers. So you know, right, pointers, right, pointer concept in C or C++, right? So that was not there. Hence what happened, you were not able to implement some bigger functionality by using pointers, right? So it has a lot of disadvantage. So to overcome that disadvantage, what uh, Dennis Ritchie did, right? Dennis Ritchie, he had come up with the language, you know, the C language, right? So, uh, and then like along with the Ken Thompson, uh, Dennis Ritchie, uh, since he had designed the C language and C language become very popular during that time. And uh, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, what they thought that let us rewrite the whole code of Unix operating system in the C language itself. So the, they wrote the whole code by using the C language. And finally, what happened? They came up with a very robust uh, production based operating system, which they called the Unix actually. Unix operating system was released, I think, in the year 1974, it was released. If I'm not wrong, some people say 1975. So, guys, there are so much uh, history there behind. Uh, all these things, how it was developed and all. I'm not really going into that because it's there are a lot of things are there to cover. You can just go with the Wikipedia of uh, Unix operating system. You'll get a lot of big stories you'll get uh, behind how the Unix was designed or how it was developed. So I'm not going into that much. I'm just in telling in a very high level, right? Who are the people who worked on it? So Ken Thompson is a master. Uh, he's, a, he's a main guy who is behind the design of Unix. 
and Dedic had uh, designed the C language. So they rewrote the whole Unix operating system in C language in 1934, and they tried to release a very robust and a stable and a production environment based operating system. So, and also what this AT&T lab did, right? They took the whole source code of Unix operating system and they started uh, giving an image into the CD-ROM or into some storage device. And they started giving to a lot of colleges and universities, universities and uh, many of the forums, right? They started distributing it. And along with that, they also gave a manual of how to operate that operating system. What is the prerequisite for it? What kind of a machine you need? So earlier at the time you had something like PDP-11 machine. They said that you have you have to install the Unix operating system in PDP-11 machine. And then like uh, they had given a manner of how to uh, do some user administration and how to log into the system. And then finally, you can start executing certain tasks or start executing some commands. You So they had given a ma manual, uh, everything and document, a huge documentation was designed by them. And all those things were given to this college universities and many other forums, like even a lot of Companies were involved. Even they, uh, you know, they distributed this Unix code, everything to them, right? So what they did, like at the time, what at t Lab did, right? They started uh, giving this code just for fifteen dollars to many companies. Just for fifteen dollars, they had given this code, source code of the Unix to many of the companies, like IBM, Sun Microsystem Company, HP Company. So what these companies did, right? The, these giant companies, IBM. Uh, HP, all those things, right? They took this Unix code actually, and they did a lot of modification, and they came with their own flavor of Unix. They say. So, for example, IBM company, they came with their its own IBM X, right? IBM X come IBM X operating system, right? HP company, it came with its own HP X operating system, and what else? Your Sun Microsystem company. It came up with its own Solaris machine. So <laughs> a lot of other uh, Unix also came, like SCO Unix, BSD Unix, Berkeley software distribution, like BSD1, BSD2, BSD3, like that. You have various uh, versions of Berkeley software distribution, right? And uh, and this, uh, all other Unix-based flavor of Unix came into the market because they started uh, uh, providing all kind of a solutions, everything through these different flavors of Unix. And these were huge costly uh, operating system because they had put a lot of effort in developing this, uh, this operating system. And they started uh, giving to many other industries or organizations for, uh, as a licensing. So they were starting making a lot of money out of this. I Means this other companies, right? Like HP, IBM, or else uh, Sun Microsystem companies, Co Unix, all these companies were making huge profit because they came with their own flavor of Unix, right? And they started working. So, so because in in my previous organization, right, where I stayed for a very long time, I had an opportunity to to work on most of this operating system. I worked even on IBM X, HP X, uh, Solaris. So all these are very good operating system guys. And uh, to be very uh, to be very specific, this operating system doesn't exist now. Nobody is using even even in fact HPX is almost gone. I think in 19, uh, 2015 itself the support was stopped. Long, uh, not 2015, 2010, eight or 2009 itself it was stopped. So HP had a lot of operating. HPX was there. Uh, 264, 264 was there. Uh, like uh, Aviator, Avatar. That is one flavor of operating system was there. Like that they had a lot of. Uh, their own flavor of Unix was there, but at, at the end, they had kept this HP UX. Even that also, they said, no, we are going to stop the support. We'll not be supporting anymore on this. So now you see that all these operating systems are almost obsolete. It means that nobody is using, no development is going on. Even they have kept, they have left as it is. So these companies have stopped giving any support. And people who use the HP products, right? People when who were using like uh, the data protective product or data backup product or in some clustering product or some networking based products. So any customers who have bought this uh, from HP company and when uh, HP is giving all the solution onto the HP UX operating system, right? Now the same customers, they all are using Linux actually because all the HP products all are working on Linux. Slowly, HP company, what they did, right? they stopped using HP UX or Tro64 or other uh, HP operating system, right? They stopped using it and they slowly shifted to Linux actually. So whatever you have HP uh, Superdome servers you have, right? 
you, you might have heard about like if you you can even buy the HP servers, HP Superdome servers. So these are the uh, HP Superdome servers actually. You could see that this is HP Superdome server. So even I have seen this, I have worked on this Superdome servers. So this in the Superdome servers, HP, right? They used to install this HP UX actually. And they used to install all those softwares and everything like, uh, for example, HP's uh, Service Guard clustering product is there. That uh, was very famous. HP company Service Guard, even today also it is there, but they all are giving support on Linux, not on HP UX. Service Guard. So the Service Guard is nothing but the HP's own clustering based product actually. High availability clustering software produced by HP and which runs on HPX and Linux. Now they stopped using HPX, they are only working on Linux. So I got an opportunity to work on the Service Guard. Uh, I worked a lot in this uh, product actually. And it's a very good product. Uh, and uh, they started working slowly. They started shifting to many other uh, operating systems like uh, SUSE operating system, Linux SUSE. Uh, Red Hat, uh, like many of the different other Linux flavors, right? They started moving into that actually. And slowly, HP UX was gone. Okay. Now, uh, fine. Anyhow, anyhow, you will not get any opportunity to work on these different flavors of Unix because no companies are using them. But some few companies are there still, their old products or their old applications still running on Solaris operating system, still they are running their shows. Just to make sure that because... Uh, Investing more money now for migrating from the Solaris to Linux is a cost effective. So they said, okay, Chalatero means Chalatero means how many days it go? Let it run like that. Later we will see like that. But anyhow, Solaris and all has already been obsolete. You will not give any support from Sun Microsystem Company because uh, Sun Microsystem Company is acquired by Oracle Company. And Oracle has uh, said we will not support on anything on Solaris. If anything is happened, you only fix it. We there is there are no support team who can fix any issues. So many companies are there who are running their old application or software or the application. They are just running it actually. They are not migrating into Linux. Many companies are already by migrated. Let's say for example, Dell EMC company. Dell EMC companies most of their uh, products, uh, Dell EMC's products were working on top of Solaris only. But uh, recently, like six seven years back only. They migrated everything onto the Linux actually. And there was a huge requirement at the time at the, this EMC company because they need a people who are very good in uh, migrating these applications, who are very good in system level, very good in Perl language or Python language because they need a, an automation, right? For that, they had a lot of requirement and uh, I didn't go. I was supposed to go to attend an interview, but I didn't go. But one of my friend was working there over there. He, he told me what kind of a migration are they doing and... Uh, uh, and uh, they are doing everything from the Solaris boxes to the Linux boxes. And they need a guy who's very good in Perl language. So luckily, I also got an opportunity to work on Perl also. Perl is a very beautiful uh, language. But nowadays, because Python had come, right, it has surpassed many of the languages. I don't know how many of you know about this language. Have you heard about TCLTK? I even worked on TCLTK also. So very good programming language, TCLTK. Scripting. So this is the tutorial you'll get. But what I'm saying is this no one, no companies are using nowadays. I mean, hardly because whatever you want to do, everything, all these things it is achievable through Python. Very hardly few companies, I mean, one one car out of some thousand company, one or two company are still might be managing everything through TCLTK scripting. Even through the TCLTK, you can even design the front end of the web applications. Like today, you can uh, the front end you can design through the uh, Angular JS or React JS or Node JS or even through PHP and all right. Uh, PHP, you know, it is there, but it, we don't use it actually. But Python. So earlier, people used to design everything through TCLTK. Now those days are gone. Now I'm saying like 14, 15 years back. But now it doesn't exist actually. Nobody is using actually. Everyone have moved to some other language. Right. So uh, uh, instead of going through learning any language or any scripting language, uh, it is better to update only on Python now. Shell scripting is required. That is still used in organization. But you have to even learn Python. As I already told yesterday, right? Python is very important. We have to learn that. Okay. So now this is one story, guys, actually, which was actually uh, like uh, during this 1980 something, many of the different flavors of Unix came into market and people 
many of the giant uh, big uh, like customers they used to get a lot of big customers and they were using this licensing uh, unix operating system in their environment and all this all their applications were deployed onto this different flavors of unix operating system see this were some of the heavy operating system guys even today like uh, your uh, you know the whole uh, your uh, uh, banking domain uh, or else your um, banking stock exchange right like whatever you do like you say you go to new york stock exchange or uh, or else your bombay stock exchange right you see that trillion you no know, tons and tons of data are getting translated right so there also i heard that they are, they were using hpo operating system at that time right because it is well capable enough to you know take up so much load actually but now i don't know they would have moved to some other i think linux is the one which is used in a back end but earlier they used to use all this heavy uh, different unix flavors of operating system was used for running some very critical applications big applications even hpox even the ibm ax right, it is also used in it is also used by the nasa's uh, engineers for building some application right so whatever you have the major applications right they had built even they had used the ibm ax also for certain things not everywhere for certain projects they had used the ibm ax actually so they say and you know like the mainframe right the whole mainframe uh, uh, huge gallons of data is everything the whole project runs on ibm ax actually earlier it is to run on the ibm ax so like that lot of heavy applications were all designed by this ibm and it is used across a lot of defense related project or you know, even onto the space program so this were used actually now i don't think so it is used actually some other has been replaced now clear now coming back to here why i told all these things because that there is a story behind to tell you about this why because that this were some of the other unix flavors of unix which were in the market and they they were making a huge profit out of it right and uh, if people want to learn this different flavors of unix right so they didn't get an opportunity because that these were all not open source it was something like you if you pay the money also you won't get the source code because hpx was never been given this code was never given by the hp company to other to the other uh, customers or, uh, or to the other company why because they don't want to share this code to anyone that's the reason similarly with ibm ax or similarly with the sun microsystem solaris operating system the source code was never ever shared to anyone it was a it was a closed source source code it's not been shared at all so later what happened in the 90s in 1990s right like before 90s 90s before 90s in 1985 or 86 there was a person by name richard stallman i think i don't know how many of you heard of his name so richard stallman he was a student at mit student at mit so he thought that we need to come up with some software where it could be free it will be freely available for anyone anybody can go through the code code of the software anybody can download the code freely anybody can modify that code and you can put back the same modified code back to the community community so that's the reason richard stallman he started a foundation he called he called it as a free software foundation so what he says that actually we in short because fsf so what richard stallman said that actually so he started his foundation and he is the one who coined the word by name open source so the open source word was coined by richard stallman what is is that if anyone is willing and suppose you have developed any of the code or you have developed some application or tool or whatever if you are willing you can put your code under the free software foundation so that your code is, your code or your tool whatever it might be it will be freely available for anyone anybody can download the code anybody can modify the code anybody can walk through the code and they can even modify it and put back the same modified back to the free software foundation such that it is it will increase the creativity so that is what richard stallman theory so this is what he said did and richard stallman the greatest contribution that actually he had designed the compiler we call it gcc compiler gnu c compiler we see gcc this whole gcc compiler he had put under the free software foundation so during that time when he had put a lot of people downloaded gcc code and they went through the whole code design they understood how exactly the compiler works and uh, many of the things like a lot of tools said uh, no lex tool yak tool a lot of libraries a lot of different applications everything was designed under the free software foundation itself so it was freely available so uh, during that time so what 
uh, Richard Stallman was seeing that if anybody would able to contribute an operating system under the free software foundation, then it will be better because we already have many things, but only one thing is missing, that is an operating system. So this is one story, one part of the story. So when he came up with this open source, see, open source doesn't mean that everything is free. Yes, the code is free for you, no doubt. The code is free. You can download the code. You can modify it also. But what happened, right? Suppose, for example, if I download it and I'm using your code or your product or your, your tool in, at my work, right? So what I will do that, if I need any support, I can reach out to a person who designed that tool. So through an open source also, you can make a money. It's not like that everything is free. It is free, no doubt. The code is free. But what is happening that the code is free under the GPL license, we say. GPL license. General public license, we say. General public license. So it is. It is. Now, if in case, if tomorrow, if you want to modify certain things or you want to completely add on any new model into that, uh, that freely free code, then you need to obey the GPA license. You need to obey those terms and uh, terms uh, and uh, you know terms and uh, rules and agreement, and then you can start adding a code or adding a new model. So sometime what happened, right? You need to even uh, get in touch with the person who is actually contributor for that code or, or for that tool. So you need to get a permission from him to add on or to add a lot of features. So I have to be part of that general public license, and then you can do it actually. So in that case, what happened, right? There is something like where you can make a huge money also because whatever you design, whatever new latest thing which you have designed, which you have incorporated in the code, right? maybe may, there are many other customers, many people are there who are interested to buy your product or to uh, you know, to go and buy your product. So they have to pay some kind of a money for you. So in that case, you can make a money out of it. <clears throat> so like that way in today's world, you could see that there are so many uh, no tools, softwares are available, which are open source, we say, but we can make a huge money by providing a proper support on that. So a lot of people in today's world, right, they are earning through support only, right? See, what happened, right? Like, uh, uh, see, for example, for the printer, HP has its own printer and Epson company has its own printer, right? Similarly, there are many other different good printers are there, right? Now, what happened, right? They can sell this printing machine in once in one time. It means that you, you can go and you can buy three, four lakh rupees, one big printer you can buy. But later what happened, you need a lot of cartridges, right? Cartridge colors and all, right? Ink color, what we say. That is costly, actually. And you know that for the lifetime, you have to use a cartridge for your printers, right? So for HP, selling the machine is not a big deal. From that, they won't get the profit. But they're going to get the profit, a lot of profit from the cartridge only, from the ink. It's something like that. So these people are so smart that they know that whatever the software which they are selling, that is peanuts. That cost is nothing. Later, what support they you know, that would be huge costly. For that only, like you need to pay heavily, hefty money for taking a support, actually. So that's the reason most of the company who work on the open source software, the licensing cost for the open source will be very minimal. But later, the support will be very too costly. So that's how you can make a lot of money. That's how... Uh, so it's not like if it is an open source, I can't make money. Not like that, guys. In today's world, even uh, uh, open source has beaten even the Microsoft also in terms of earning revenue or in terms of earning money. Right. So that's the reason uh, Microsoft company CEO like uh, Bill Gates was very much against with the uh, Richard Stallman, and uh, there are a lot of conversion has happened between these two people, <coughs> where Richard Stallman was uh, favoring the open source concept, but. Bill Gates was very much against with this because Bill Gates says that our smart engineers, they develop the product, they develop the application. Why we have to make it as an open source? What we're going to earn from that? So there was a huge debate was happening with these two people and some older videos in YouTube, you can see that there is a lot of conversion is happening in between these two people live in a live video. And both of them are keeping up their points to justify how we can make a huge contribution to, to, to the society if we make everything as an open source. So he was very much, uh, you know, he was very much, Richard Stallman was very much uh, want to make everything as an open source because it will increase all creativity. It will it'll boost up, uh, you know, the whole community. That is one thing. And second, everyone will get to know how that exact that code works. And you it will also bring up a lot of new innovative ideas. Right? And it also provides a lot of opportunity to uh, you know to work or to learn on many other technologies 
So that is what he wanted. He coined this word open source. Whereas Bill Gates at the same time, he was very much against. So that you can go through it, guys, at any point of time later. Okay. Now, so in the year 1991, there's a person from Finland by name Linux Benedict Torvalds. I think you might have heard about this person's name. He is from basically, he is from Finland, studying at Hels, uh, Helsinki University. Helsinki University. And this guy, Linus Starwells, actually, he was working on one of the project, actually. Okay, Helsinki University. And uh, where he wanted to develop an operating system where he can run that application. But ultimately, what happened? Linux Benedict Torvalds didn't get any open source operating system where on top of that operating system, he can run that application. So hence what happened, right? This Linux Benedict Torvalds, he had approached a person. Uh, his name was, uh, what's his name, man? Uh, uh, what's his name? Tenenbaum, mm. uh, Andrew Tenenbaum. So Andrew Tenenbaum, he is a guy who was a professor. He had developed an operating system, the Minix operating system, Minix OS. So if you go to the website, I think there is a website by name uh, Minix dot org. So this is managed by his team people, uh, Andrew Tannenbaum, Minix, yeah, Minix three, Minix operating system, Minix three. So it's an operating system which was des designed by uh, Andrew Tannenbaum. So this guy, he was by profession, he was a professor actually. And uh, to, in one of the universities, he was a professor and he was teaching the concept of operating system by showing this Minix operating system to the students. So he has designed on, for showcasing uh, or for doing some experiments uh, with the students. That's what he designed it. And uh, he was using this operating system in his colleges and all, right? And he had some hardware configuration on top of that, like he had installed this Minix and just to <coughs> make the students comfortable, he had explained about how this Minix operating system works. So Andrew Turnbaum, was a professor and this Benedict Torvalds, he was a student actually like that. So there was a, uh, he was a student, he was a professor and uh, and it, uh, sorry, Linus Torvalds, what did, uh, Linus Torvalds, what he did, right? He tried to uh, uh, reach out to Andrew Turnbaum, asking to share this Minix operating system code. He, he said that I'm working on some project, please give me your Minix operating system. But Andrew Turnbaum hesitated to give the code. He said, I'm not going to give you the code because I never shared my code, source code to anyone. So I'll not give you. So then I, Linus Torvalds thought that, let me write my own code from the scratch itself. So initially for the fun sake, he was right. He started writing the code for an operating system from the scratch. But when he was working, he was contra he was uh, posting, every day he was posting it to the internet about the code development, whatever he was doing. And uh, a lot of people from the other part of the globe know they started contributing for his projects. And finally what happened in 1992, uh, Helsinki in 1992. So in a span of, I think just in a span of 11 months, right? He came up with his own operating system. He called it as a free operating system. So Linus Torvalds came with his own operating system. He calls a freaks, right? And, uh, but uh, Linus Torvalds friends, his well wishes follows, right? They said, don't keep the name as a freaks. Instead, instead of that, you can keep it as a Linux, L-I-N-U-X. You replace S with X. So finally, what happened? This Freaks was renamed as Linux, L-I-N-U-X. So in 1992, the first version of Linux was released. That is 1.0.0. This was the first version which was released. And today, I think we are having something 5.0, 5 5.0 series or 6.0 series. So if you go to the kernel.org, K-E-R-N-E-L, kernel.org. This is a website which is managed by the Linux Torvalds and his teammates. So the latest is 6.10, 6.10. That's the latest version <coughs> which we're having today. And this, uh, I mean, I don't think he's a contributor now. So there are a lot of other people are there. He was working, uh, he was a main person who who came up with this website as a kernel.org. So this kernel.org has... It it you you it has all the source code of all the versions of Linux, whatever he has released so far, from 1.00 till 
today's 6.10, right? All source code is available. So you can start download the source, source code of Linux itself. So it is one just 138 MB. When I used to download, right, it used to be some 350 MB, something like that. Now, like they have did a lot of uh, like modification to the kernel code. And today they have came up with this uh, Linux 6.10 version, right? So now, and what they did, right, uh, during that time, so Linux Torvalds, he contributed this, his Linux operating system to the Free Software Foundation. So you know that Free Software Foundation was the organization which was started by Richard Solomon. So Linus Torvalds, he contributed this Linux, the whole code to the Free Software Foundation. So earlier that, a lot of other tools were there. Even a compiler was there. Many other things were there. One thing was missing was a Linux operating system or the operating system, which Linux Torvalds fulfilled it actually. Finally, he gave this code to the Free Software Foundation and people started using. So many of the giant, uh, you know, like, distributor at the time they came into it one was the biggest distributor was uh i don't know whether you have heard of it slackware slackware was basically one of the very big uh, organization i think it is it's an european company uh basically from italy if i'm not wrong so they what they did right this they took the code of the linux from the free software foundation and all other dependency codes were all downloaded plus they did a lot of tweaking into it and then finally they came with their own flavors of Slackware Linux like that. And they started uh, burning in CDs and they started distributing the CDs to the college, universities, companies. Many of the companies, they started using the Slackware Linux by installing it to the Linux, uh, into the uh, Exetics uh, boxes or a simple PC or a simple laptop, desktop. They installed it and they started working on it. So after Slackware, you have heard about a very big uh, uh, distribution came into existence by name Red Hat. So Red Hat is very popular. Red Hat was, Red Hat was started uh, in US. And uh, now you know that Red Hat is acquired by IBM. So Red Hat uh, came with their own uh, Linux uh, uh, flavors. So initially they came with uh, Red Hat 7, Red Hat 1, Red Hat 2, Red Hat 3, like that, right? Uh, even Red Hat 9 is also there, which was the last uh, Red Hat series version. Later they came with RHL, RHL 1, RHL 2, which you call it as an enterprise Linux. So most of the organization today, you could see that they are using RHLs, like RHL1, RHL2, RHL3. Like the latest, what they're using is RHL7 or RHL9 they're using. Eight is also there. I think RHL9 they're using in our organization. So you will see the latest RHLs they're using. And even you'll also working on RHL only. So when you get into the company, when you start working on a project, right, you will see most of the servers are RHL-based servers or Red Hat Linux servers. And those are all licensing costs. It means that you need to pay a license cost for permission, actually. Right, so that the company will take care of it, and you will also get some support from the Red Hat organization if you are taking a licensing, uh, like software from them. Red Hat was very, very favorable or popular for the servers edition. Say, whenever you want to have a lot of servers, like for example, DNS server, NFS server, NI server, Samba server, Squid server, Mail server, you need to configure a lot of mail servers. So, companies to go with the Red Hat because Red Hat provides a lot of good solutions onto the server editions, like that. After Red Hat, uh, there is one more big organization by him by name Suze. It is basically from Germany, right? This is a very big uh, Linux distribution. Later, it was acquired by a company by name Novel. It was acquired by Novel. So Suze was very popular in um, most of the European countries like Sweden, Germany, France. Uh, most of these uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, right? They were using Suze. Uh, Red Hat was very popular in US. The whole US states, they use Red Hat. Even in uh, Asia also, right? In India, Pakistan, uh, many other countries like Bangladesh, like all these places, Red Hat was more favorable actually, right? People were using Red Hat. Suze was heavily used in your European countries, right? After that, you have many other distribution game. One of the other popular was Ubuntu. Ubuntu was started by a person by name Mark Shuttleworth. And uh, he started this organization in uh, South Africa. So by profession, this person is an astronaut, but he started this Ubuntu organization where he said that uh, we are going to get rid of this Microsoft OS from this from this earth. We don't want to use the Microsoft OS at all. So he was very much emphasizing to make the Linux more user-friendly and a uh, lot of addition, a uh, lot of, uh, a desktop based operating system, you uh, like Linux operating system, uh, uh, it came into the market and Ubuntu was very popular on that actually. 
but uh, slowly what happened is they gained the market because that Ubuntu was one of the most favorable operating system which was used by many communities. After the Red Hat, the next which is most favorable or used is Ubuntu only. In fact, even in many organizations, software companies, right, they're using, instead of using RHL or Red Hat, they're using Ubuntu. So a lot of Ubuntu, different flavors of Ubuntu also came like U Ubuntu, K Ubuntu, uh, P Ubuntu, like the different Ubuntu flavors had also come. Uh, it supports both uh, uh, for the development activity as well as for the server edition. Whenever you want to go with the server editions, you can go with the Ubuntu. You're having both open source as well as a paid version also. Paid version, you'll get heavy, uh, you know, you'll get a lot of support from the Ubuntu community. That's what many companies go with the paid version of Ubuntu. And uh, if suppose you want to configure any servers, things, right? You can even go with the Ubuntu also. Ubuntu is also very much popular. Even today also, Ubuntu is very popular. A lot of uh, development activity happens on top of uh, Ubuntu, not on RHL or not on Red Hat. It happens only on Ubuntu flavors. So like that, there are many other guys, but you have to only know few things because maybe in an interview, they might ask which version of Linux or which fair, which uh, distributed Linux you are using. You can say I'm using RHL Red Hat or you can say Ubuntu, right? These are the two Macs they use or sometimes they might ask you, have you worked on SUSE? Some companies might be using SUSE. That's what they might ask. Yeah, you can say, yes, I have worked on SUSE also, right? Um, if you work on any... Yeah, if you work on any one flavor of distribution, that is sufficient guide. You need not to really worry about much. Okay. Uh, so that's all, guys, about this uh, uh, small story on how the Unix and Linux came into existence. And now you you know that most of the companies are using Linux, that is Red Hat Linux, and we have to learn Red Hat Linux only, right? Red Hat or Ubuntu. So most of our classes will be combination of this. Either I'll be using Red Hat Linux or I'll be using Ubuntu or else I'll be using CentOS. Sometimes I'll be using the Amazon Linux also. So any one of this Unix uh, flavor, Linux flavor, I'll be using in my class. But most of the time you will see that Ubuntu is the one which I'll be always be choosing. But for something like, for example, Ansible, as I said, right? Ansible for Ansible, I'll be doing everything on Amazon Linux actually, right? So in even today also, many of the customers are are using Amazon Linux. They started using Amazon Linux. So that's how some companies have started using that flavor, right? Because Amazon Linux is brought by the Amazon itself. It's a ditto like a Red Hat only, right? It's a ditto like Red Hat without any uh, licensing. You can freely use it actually without licensing. And uh, you will get support also from Amazon. So that's the reason a lot of customers, they have went into the Amazon Linux. <clears throat> right okay fine good so this is all about now let's see now other things what we will going to cover today okay so now okay now before getting into it so yesterday we discussed that uh operating system is done by a system software which controls and coordinate the hardware resources for the different application program right so whenever any application or the user he want to communicate with the hardware, he can only communicate to the hardware via with the help of an OS, right? Now, what happened, right? Just to redefine one more thing, the same thing. Now, here you have a user or the application. It means either user will be running or the application is getting executed. User or the application, that's what I'm saying, user or the application, right? Here, you have beneath here, you have something known as an operating system. Or in short, we can call, we can even call it as a kernel, right? Kernel, right? And below that is an hardware. Here you have something known as a hardware. Let me draw uh, even hardware also. Let me draw a circle only. Hardware, hardware could be anything as we discussed yesterday, right? You have various different hardware devices are there. Okay, now whenever a user is communicating to the hardware, he can communicate with the help of a kernel or an operating system. Without a kernel, your user cannot communicate with the hardware. Now what happened, right? Now what has happened, right? Whenever a user want to communicate with the kernel, it cannot correct directly communicate with the kernel. It cannot directly communicate with the kernel. There has to be a software layer or there has to be an interface through which a user can actually communicate with the kernel. And that is via, with the help of, with the help of something, we call it as a shell. 
call it as a shell. What is a shell if you say that? Shell is an interface between a user and the kernel. Whenever a user want to communicate with a kernel, it has to communicate via with the help of a shell. The user will first communicate with the shell and finally the shell will communicate with your kernel. And of course, kernel will communicate with the hardware finally. So this is how it happens actually. So shell is an interface between the user and the kernel. So in Linux actually, in Linux, we have a shell. So we have a shell and the default shell. Okay, Linux, in Linux, the default shell is bash shell. What is the shell name, guys? Bash shell. Whenever somebody, somebody asks you what is the shell which you use in Linux, we have to say it's a bash shell. So bash shell is also designed by within the Free Software Foundation. So whatever Richard Salman has designed, right? The Free Software Foundation, right? Even your bash also falls under the Free Software Foundation itself, actually. So many people who are part of the Free Software Foundation, they designed this bash shell. Actually. Bash shell is a is designed by many engineers working in free software and foundation community, right? So bash shell is complete implementation of bone shell. So there was earlier, there was a bone shell. This bone shell was, bone shell was designed by the person, by the, by the by the by the by the person his name is Steve Bond <clears throat> and this was the shell B O U R N E Bond and this was a shell which was implemented with Unix operating system with that Unix system. With that, so people who designed the bash shell they learned this bone shell they understood all the features and they did a lot they did a lot of modification and then finally they they came up with this own shell as a bash shell. Bash means born again shell. What is a bash shell form, full form? Bash means born, born, born again. SH means shell. Born again, it's a complete emulation of the bone shell. Born, B-O-R-N, born, B-O-R-N, born again shell, B-A-S-H, we say. So this is the most favorable uh, shell which we used in Linux actually, right? And this is the shell which is still being used, right? Because so many features are there which uh, we have in bone shell or there are many other shells are there like c shell is there ash shell is there uh, and uh, k shell is there corn shell is there so you could see that bash shell is a superset of all the other shells so that's what a lot of people in the company they started using bash because bash has a lot of features so as a part of learning linux we have to even learn how this bash works or what is this bash is all about and also learn bash shell scripting right Bash shell scripting also we should learn because we are automating many tasks and we automate all these tasks with the help of the bash shell scripting, right? That's what you could see that when you're whenever you're getting call from any companies, right? They'll ask you, have you worked on bash shell scripting? How many years of experience you're having? So it means that actually we need to understand how this bash shell works and also what are the syntaxes you need to follow while writing a shell script and then finally start writing the script actually. If you understand all these things, then you'll become some good script writer, good bash shell script writer, right? You need to understand how the shell works. You need to understand the syntaxes, all this. Plus, you need to understand all those scripting uh, constructs, if if condition, uh, 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 if then else condition, for loop condition, while condition, until condition, right? Case condition, like that we have so many conditionals are there. Right, those we call the programming constructs. So we need to learn those programming constructs. That's what I said as a scripting. I said. So once you learn all these things, then you become a very good script writer. Right. So now coming back here. Now bash shell is a default shell. So this bash shell will always communicate. Always the communication happens to the user to the bash, and from the bash shell, the communication happened to the kernel. So what happened, right? How the communication is happening? Now, for example, suppose a user is executing some command. 
he is executing some command or he is running some application. Right. Now this command execution or the application execution will be taken care by your bash shell. As soon as a user starts running a command or executing some application, immediately the shell comes to the picture. The shell will take care of execution of this command or the application. It takes it. And finally, the shell will communicate with the kernel. Actually. So what I said that shell, the bash shell creates an environment to execute any command or a program. It creates an environment, we say. It creates an environment. So the question comes, Rajesh, without a shell, can I run any program or the application? No, without a shell, you cannot run it. There has to be a shell. Okay. What about Windows? Does Windows also have a shell? Windows operating system? Yes, it also has a shell. So if you consider, this is my screen. This is my desktop screen. This desktop screen will act like a shell because you are sitting on top of this. Uh, because see, as an end user, I am a user, right? I can able to see this screen, right? You say that, Rajesh, I want to go to some drive. No problem, man. Click on this. Go to the C drive. See, you can navigate anywhere what you want. How it is all happening, how you're able to view any content or how you're able to run any application. Suppose I want to launch the browser. I'll just do a double click. See, it will launch the browser. Now, who is running or who is executing? Yes, everything has been executed by the shell only. Okay, whereas in case of uh, Windows operating system, is there any shell? Yes, there's a, window, there's a shell is there. What is it? Turbo C shell. Right. Turbo shell is used in Windows. Now it is replaced with some other shell. Right. Like that, every operating system has a shell. IBM X, IBM X operating system, Rajesh, what you mentioned, which is designed by, does also it has a, yes, it has a shell. They used to use a con shell. KSH, we say, con shell. Like that way, guys, there are different types of shells are there, which are used by different other flavors of uh, Unix operating system. But Linux, since the day one, in from 1992 till date, right, Bash is a default shell which is used. Always. Right? And what we said, what we discussed, Bash is going to create an environment. Without a Bash shell, a user cannot execute any command or a program. There has to be some command or a program. When a user executes, the shell will take care of it. It is something like where, uh, you know, like uh, uh, to give, uh, give an analogy, right? Uh, we usually go to the temple, right? To pray for a God, to get a job in a Microsoft company or to get a job in a very big companies, right? So when you talk to the God, God doesn't understand your language. God will understand only a mythological language. That is Sanskrit language. Now, when you're communicating to the God, God doesn't understand it, right? So what you do that you ask uh, to the pujari or the priest that uh, please ask the God, go inside the temple and please pray for me to ask the God to get a job in Microsoft company. So he will listen to you because he understands both the language, the local language as well as Sanskrit language, right? Mythological language. So he will go inside and he'll pray to the God. And uh, he will ask you that please get a job for him in Microsoft company. Yeah, and if God is happy with you, he'll give a boon to you. It's something like that. Shell is something like your priest or a pujari, we say. Your colonel is like a God. Something like that. <clears throat> now, okay. So now what we have to understand uh, effectively is that actually that now, how this communication from the user to the kernel happens? There are many different ways are there where the communication can be made from the user to the kernel. What are the different ways how user or application can communicate with the kernel? What are the different ways? The first important, this is the question. The first is that you can communicate with the help of a commands. You have lots of commands. When you execute a command, the user is actually communicating with the kernel. Fine, very good commands. What are the things? We have something the APIs, application programming interface, APIs we say. Through an API also, a user can actually communicate with the kernel. To tell you, for example, suppose for example, you have an open API, open system call or open API. Read API. Right API, something. Right. These are something like these are function calls. These are nothing but the these are the wrappers we say actually, or these are the APIs actually. Right. Like that way, for some call. 
exact like this. These are APIs actually. So through this way also, you can actually communicate from your application to the kernel or from the user to the kernel. What are the other ways? The third way is through your system calls. You can even call the system call also. In fact, this API will in turn call the system calls only to communicate with. And fourth is some type of some kinds of signals you'll be using. And there are something was a uh, some special file system we use actually to communicate. Those special file systems are, I will tell you about this later. What is it? Proc file system, proc FS and sysfs we say. And the last method to communicate is IOCTLs, input output control operation. Input or IOCTLs we say. So by using any one of these methods, a user can actually communicate with the kernel. There are six methods are there. If suppose ask you, if suppose somebody asks you, Rajesh, is there any seventh method, eight, nine method? No, I don't think so. There are any other methods apart from this. So these are some of the important methods through which it can communicate. Now, uh, Rajesh, what we use usually to communicate, we always use the commands, man. We always use the command and commands will get executed. And command will be executed by the kernel and you will get the output of the command. Yeah, it means that I have to just know the commands, that's all. So do you have to really know the APIs? Do you have to really know this? You know, do you have to really understand or do you have to really break my head to learn system calls, special file system, IOCTLs? No, it is not required. Only for us, as a DevOps engineer, I will be only interacting with my system or the kernel with the help of a commands. Right? Or else we will write some script and run that script and that script will give me an output. That's all. We need not to know other but yeah, just for the knowledge sake, I'm just saying that there are these are the six different types of ways where the communication can be made from the user to the kernel. Am I clear on this, sir? Till here. Any doubts you have? Yeah, uh, Yashar, Nadesh, uh, Navin, Alam. No, sir. Okay, uh, Shikhar, did you understood? Yes, sir. Okay, great, sir. Shivam Bhai, any doubts you have? Okay, no? Vinod, Vinod? Okay. Sure, good. So, good. Yeah, thank you. Now, okay, good, very good. So we have understood this concept very well now. Fine, good enough. Now, what's the next we have to understand? Okay, these are the six methods, fine. So whenever user want to communicate or application want to communicate, yeah, any one method can be used, either command or API or system calls, signals, proc file systems or special file systems, like proc or sys file system. This I'll be telling you after some time. After four or five session, I'll come across with one topic where I'll be covering up this point. This is very important also. Sometimes you will be doing a lot of manipulation uh, in the system level, because you have a, a root access when you're working on a system and you will tend to go and change some parameters in the proc file system. That's what you should know. Sometimes people, uh, DevOps engineer will be doing some changes in this proc file system because in the documentation they would have mentioned, go and do these changes, go and do these changes. So you'll be doing it, but you might not really know why, why, why you're doing or what you're doing, but you have been instructed to do it, you will do it. But why we are doing it, we will see it after some time, right? Sometime, right, uh, a developer will say that, okay, you just execute this commandment, like that he will say. How we will say, you know? He will say, sir, he will say that, Rajesh, go and execute this commandment. He will just say, please execute this command, that's all. Now you'll happily copy, paste, and run it. But you might ask, you might get a doubt, why he's saying this one? Oh, it means that Rajesh, echo command, he's writing this value one into this into this file, actually, or into this IP forward file. Oh, okay, okay. You can even say that, okay, go and add, or go and even execute this like this, he will say. Or he will say that, go and run like this. So you should be able to know why he's telling you to do like this, actually. So you should be able to know that, okay, there's something like a proc file system, oh. So Rajesh has said something like a proc file system is a special file system. So through which a user can actually communicate the kernel. So you might ask Rajesh by passing this value and to this entire path where which is not but the proc under proc, some files are where he's trying to edit it. 
Is it something the user is actually communicated to the kernel by passing this one value to this file? Yes, user is actually communicating the kernel by just modifying this file, which is a part or which comes under the proc itself. So proc is a special file system, or we call it as a pseudo file system. Pseudo is something like it's a false file system. There is no file system doesn't exist with that with that, but still we it's a false file system, or it's a special file system, or it's a pseudo file system. We say. So we can communicate through a proc file system to the kernel, or even there is something known as a sys file system. What is the sys file system and all? We will see it later. Don't worry. So not really required to learn much, but just in a very high level, I should know because sometime you might be asked to work on that proc or sys, go and do changes some parameter and all. Like you have to blindly follow the instruction what is given by the developer to do it actually later if you get any doubts what why you are doing all of it you can even ask the developer only he will help you to understand like why he is doing the changes into that file actually right and what kind of effect you're going to get after doing the changes that also will help you or else if you already know it you will understand a better way in much more better way when you are interacting with the developer so that's what i would expect that you should learn in such a way that you should ask very valid question to the developer whenever you're working as a devops engineer or the cloud opt-in kernel because you already know something on the system. Now you are asking more and more to learn or understand in a better way. That should be your uh, condition when you're working as a DevOps engineer. Correct? Now, very good. <clears throat> now, the next comes is something like, so there is one important concept which we have to learn, guys, which we call it as a user space and the kernel space. After this, we will get into Linux operating system and start learning something on commands. Okay, but let me finish this. User space. Some of you already know this. Kernel space. Okay, there's something user space in the kernel space which we have to learn actually. Now, what is the user space in the kernel space? See, now you know that actually that, suppose my this is my laptop, guys. So I'm using my Lenovo uh, i5 uh, processor laptop with uh, 16 GB of RAM memory and blah, blah. If you go here, and if you do a right click and go to the properties, you could see that you could see that my Lenovo actually it's a 12th generation i5 processor, 16 GB of RAM, and this is a device a product ID. You will get some specification of your hardware device as well as your Windows, right? You are getting some property or right some specification. Now, right now, whenever I want to boot my Windows operating system, how you do it actually? How you do boot it up? Now you'll go and you'll try to uh, you know press the power button, right? What you will do? You will just go and press the power button. So there's a power button is there which you are going to press it, right? Now what the power? As soon as the power on, or as soon as switch on the power button, what happens, right? The power goes to your BIOS. Yeah, BIOS. So as soon as you initialize the uh, uh, you power on the button, what happened? There will be a sign something like a BIOS chip will be there. There will be a BIOS chip. Now this BIOS chip has uh, has all low level uh, instructions, right? And it will try to what the BIOS chip will do that basic uh, the full form is basic input output system. This BIOS chip, right? It will be there in the motherboard. So this will get a power. It has a lot of instructions, which we call it as a BIOS code. We call it a BIOS codes. What is it, guys? We call it as a BIOS code. These are BIOS codes. These are BIOS codes. BIOS, BIOS codes, which are written in, uh, written in assembly level language. And this BIOS codes, it does, we call it as a initial bootstrapping. So it does initial bootstrapping. It means that it will try to boot up your system or your operating system or the OS. It does the initial bootstrapping. It'll do the initial bootstrapping actually. What it does initial bootstrapping. So your BIOS is going to check which are all the hard devices which are connected to the system. You have a RAM memory, you have a hard disk, you have a screen, you have a mouse, you have a monitor, you have a USB drive, you have a USB, you have a mouse drive, mouse is there. A lot of devices are there, right, which are connected to a system. 
so it will do the initial bootstrapping what does it the initial bootstrapping is it's going to it's going to take all the hardware devices connected to the system and checks and also whether they all are working in a proper state so it's going to check whether all they all are working in a proper state for example your ram assume that your ram memory primary memory right if it is not properly working assume that now what happened right the bios is going to check whether ram device is working fine or not if it understand that ram device is not properly working then it will start beeping up beeping up There's something like pp 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 like that you will get some sound so it means that when you switch on the system either your laptop or a desktop if you start getting some beep 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 you can understand that there is some issue with some hardware so maybe right ram is not properly working and you will get some in some console or screen you might get some message saying that uh, right it is not able to identify the ram device at all like that so it means that either there could be it has been corrupted or either it could be that the by uh, the ram uh, uh, device right the ram chip right it has not been connected properly into a system so you can either open the system and check whether ram is properly been placed if it is not properly placed open it try to rub in a cotton uh, this one uh, cloth and again you put it properly and see whether uh, it works or not if it doesn't work then i think ram will go off or else sometime there will be you lose connection which is not been properly set you need to just again reconnect it again properly the ram and now it will things start working so what i'm saying means like it uh, your bios code will initially does the bootstrapping it also initialize it initialize all the hardware devices it initialize all the hardware devices and you know you know that when you switch on a system you could see that in the black screen you will be getting lot of devices getting connected it will show you okay uh, uh, you know like uh, you are uh, you know, like all the peripherals what is connected mouse is connected keyboard is connected blah 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 usb device connected network card is connected sound card is connected video card is connected connected like many devices which are there as part of a system inside right all it will show that these are all the devices these are all the vendor id device id all those characteristics or specification of that hardware it will show you it will be keep running that message will keep come popping up in the screen and finally what happened right the bios is going to understand that where exactly i can get the information about the operating system so what the bios will do bios is going to will give control to the bootloader so bootloader is a special program which is invoked by the bios to to get the i think it is hand over to mbr yes i'm coming to that only so bootloader is a special program which is invoked by the bios to get the information about the operating system itself where exactly the operating system is all about right so now what is happening is that actually that now so after bios complete it gives control to the bootloader but bootloader is a special program in linux the bootloader is grub bootloader in windows the bootloader is ntldr bootloader now what happened right this bios will do so much operation and finally it understands okay the first sector of the hard disk you have a hard disk right this is a hard disk a hard disk this is a hard disk this is hdd we say hdd hard disk the first sector or the byte well of the byte of the hard disk this is a first sector this is the first sector of your hard disk this is the first sector of the hard disk first sector and this the first sector first sector of i'm sorry sector of hard disk is your mbr master boot record this is and uh, and this mbr has the information about the operating system where is your operating system so now in case of in case of windows it understands that 
the information about the OS, OS is there in C drive. C drive. Right? So you know that somewhere under C drive, program files, under that something like a sys is there, like that. Somewhere it will go to that path and it will try to get the information about the OS. That is Windows OS. Similarly, in case of Linux, actually, there is a partition by name slash boot. Under that, there is a file by name VM Linus image. This VM Linus image is your operating system image. So under slash boot, so this MBR, Based on your based on what operating system you have installed in your in your laptop, if it is install if I have installed the Windows and it will go to the C drive and try to check where exactly that image of the OS is there, it will go and it will try to boot it up. And whereas in Linux, actually, what happened? It knows the slash boot is a partition or it is a it is a path where I can get the information about the OS. So who will do all those things? Activity your bootloader. So BIOS chip or the BIOS code will give control to the bootloader. What the bootloader will do, it will try to go to the first disk of the hard disk. This is not about MBR. In that MBR, it will get the information about where, where exactly the OS is placed. Based on operating system. If it is a Linux miss, it is a slash boot directory. Or if it is a Windows miss, under C drive, program files, sys, somewhere there is some path where it will try to get the information of OS. It will try to take that and it will try, try to load it up. Who is going to load? Your bootloader. So in case of Linux, Grub is a bootloader which you used. In case of a Windows, NTLDR is a bootloader which you uses. So now what happened, right? Once the BIOS gives control to the bootloader, once the bootloader finds the information about the OS, what the Grub bootloader will do that, the Grub bootloader, it tried to divide your RAM memory. This is your RAM memory, right? So assume that in my case, 16 GB is my RAM memory. In my case, in my operating, in my machine, in my, in my machine, you know that I'm using a 16 GB of RAM. 16 GB of RAM. What it will do means it will try to divide this whole RAM memory into two different spaces like this. It will try to divide the whole RAM memory into two spaces. Say, for example, like 12 GB out of the 16 GB, what it will do that? 12 GB, 12 GB, it will be called it as a user space. And remaining 4 GB out of 16 GB, 12 GB is for user space. And this remaining 4 GB of this memory, we call 4 GB of memory, we call it as a kernel space. Now this bootloader, what it will do that, it will try to divide this it will try to divide this whole RAM into two different spaces. We call the user space and the kernel space. Now, what this bootloader will do, for example, a grub bootloader, it want to load the Linux operating system, Linux image. It will try to go to the slash boot. And there, there's a file by name VM Linus image. So there's a file by name VM Linus, like this, L-I-N-U-Z image, as well as there is a, uh, there's one more uh, file will be there known as a init RD image. So what the bootloader will do, it will take both this, it will try to take both these images like this, and it will try to load into your, your kernel space of your RAM. It will try to load here. In this memory, it will try to load it here. Got it? It will try to load this. Who is going to do that loading? Your grub bootloader will load it. Same thing for Windows, NTLDR boot, boot, bootloader, it will try to detect where exactly the uh, Windows operating system image is there. That is an OS image. Okay, it will go to the C drive under that program file, something, sys, blah, blah, some path will go. Oh, there it forms the image of the OS is there, that is Windows OS. It will try to load that image into your kernel space of the RAM memory. So, did you understood till here? Do you have any doubts? So guys, this is a one-time activity. I will not explain it again and again because just one time I will explain so that you remember this whole thing. Um, no doubt, if you forget also, there's no, that's fine, okay. But I'm just telling you a very high level how things happen because 
this is a very basic we are starting from here we'll start learning everything on linux or windows we have to start learning on how exactly linux will we work and we come across with file system commands many other concepts are going to come slowly all these things will be unrelieved again one more time because when i'm explaining deep about how things works happens in the linux machine or the linux operating system you will get we will come across with all such concepts you will be hearing many times about the user space kernel space uh, you know like about this vm linux image or any tardy sometime you will come across with this such words actually that's what i thought that let me take you into a little bit elaborate so that you will understand it's a one time that's all so again the question comes rajesh uh, being a devops engineer should i know all these things not really required but yeah if you have heard about all this activity what happens uh, during boot up time how things happens how exactly the system boots up it is one time if you learn that is sufficient guys you need not to really go through the books again to read it yeah if you are interested you can deep dive and learn it but this much is sufficient is it clear so guys do you have any doubts till here because i have to move further so i have to just uh, confirm from you that if you have understood everything till here sunit any percentage is there uh, like uh, 16 gb divided into 4 gb or 12 gb yeah there is something like 3 by 4th of your ram memory is used by the user space 1 by 4th of your ram memory is using current space sometime what happened it depends upon operand it depends upon the configuration also you can even divide also equally 50 is to 50 50 can divide but usually what happened right kernel space doesn't need much uh, space with very less space only you will try to boot up your operating system whereas a uh, user space you need more memory you need more ram memory for the user space because here what happened in the user space you will be running many of the processes many of the processes you will be running many of the users will log into the system say in case of linux as i said right root is a super user is a system only. root user will log in rajesh will log in rajesh is some user who will log in the system ramesh is some other user <coughs> sunit is some user another another user we know this some other user ashish is some other user right these are the different users who who are using this system so they can log in with their own credential they'll be logging to the same system so you need more memory space when it comes to user user space you need a more memory you need more mem memory so that all these users can log in so that's the reason user space will be given little slightly more uh, memory space will be given in some occasion what happen you will keep it as a 50 50 there it is also configurable also but by default 3 by 4th is given for user space 1 by 4th is given for kernel space clear okay good question so you could say so now you the question comes rajesh there are so many processes are running yesterday you open some task uh, bar a task manager something like this right click task manager you told that rajesh these are the processes which are running see so many processes are running uh rajesh do all this process are this process are running in a user space of the ram memory yes there are many processes are there which are running user space but there are many processes are there which are also running in a kernel space so in case of linux you might have heard about something was it process yesterday we saw a process is a running uh, uh, running instance of a program in memory because a process or a program in execution because a process most of the process they run in a user space but there are many processes are there which runs in a kernel space also for that uh, we mostly we call it as a task actually so task are the one which will get executed in the kernel space what is it tasks task are the one you might even see that lot of people will be using a task or process interchangeably they use it while while communicating but task is something which will be running in the kernel space right sometime even kernel also initialize something as a kernel threads kernel also initialize something as a kernel threads so lot of kernel threads will also be running under the kernel space of your ram memory what is it kernel threads kernel threads we not to really worry about all these things but yes these are there actually right now what happened right so let me open one more and this is the user space this is your ram memory divided to do space right this is the user space we know that and this is the kernel space we know this right this is the space and this is the kernel space so in the kernel space your vm linux image and init tardy image as per this diagram it will be loaded into your memory right 
right? So what happens that here in case of your uh, here what happened, right? Your operating system will be loading. It means that your whole kernel will be up and running in a kernel space. Your kernel will be up and running. The user logs in in a user space. The user, any user, he could be a root user or he could be a normal user like Rajesh, Mahesh, Suresh, any user, they will be logging under the user space. Right? They'll be logging in the user space and they'll be working. So they are work. So we call them as a kernel is running in a kernel space. They are running under the privileged mode, we say. We call it a privileged mode. Or we call it as a protected mode. Whereas user space, in user space, the user uh, or a root user or anything, they are under the unprotected mode, we say. Unprotected mode. What is it? I will tell you after some time. Just you need to understand. Okay, unprotected mode. They will be running under the unprotected mode, actually. This is working in the privileged mode or unprotected mode. But whereas user space, all the processors or all the users who logs in under, under the space, they will be an they will be they will be working under the unprivileged mode or in a unprotected mode. We said. So now you know that this is a user who will be running, or this is an application which will be running in user space, and this is a kernel which is running in your kernel space. Whenever a user want to communicate with the kernel, there has to be a shell. So that's how what happened right here. What happened? A thin layer will be created like this. So this we call it as a bash shell. What is it? We call it as a bash shell. What is it, guys? Call it as a bash shell. So what is it, bash shell? Bash, you know that bash is a default shell. See, this is a bash shell. Bash shell will be running. Bash will be running. Now, the user, whenever he want to communicate with the kernel, he communicate, the user want to communicate with the kernel, he communicate with the bash shell, and finally the bash will, will communicate with the kernel. Is it clear now? Did you got some idea, guys? Are you finding interesting? Or is it boring? Yes, yes, it is interesting. Okay. Sir, processes running in kernel space uh, can be called daemon. Yes, right. It's running as a daemon. Yeah. Some processes are running as a daemon in the background. Yes, we call it as a... Those are all kernel threads, we say. Say, for example, like uh, your K-swap-D, kernel-swap daemon. K-swap-D. One of the processes which is running, we call it the kernel-swap-daemon processes because it, end, it ends with a D. Like that, we have something like a K-thread-D. K-thread-D. This is also one of the kernel thread or the kernel process which is running. Okay, so most of the daemon process or many some of the background processes, process which are running in the background, those processes will be running in the kernel space. Yes, right. Okay. So this is what at the end we require to understand. There are many things are there. Slowly, one by one, I'll be relieving it, uh, revealing uh, with you. But this is what ultimately I have to know it. So in a whole Linux operating system, whenever I logged in as some user, you will be directly you'll be landing into the user space of the RAM memory. You'll be sitting here and working. Right? So if a root user logs in or Rajesh logs in, right, they'll be sitting on top of the user space. And what Rajesh will do, Rajesh will try to execute some command. Say, for example, he's executing some command. Like, for example, he's executing ls command. He's executing date command. He's executing a command. He's executing a command by name if config command. You could see that he's executing several commands like this. A lot of commands he's executing, these commands. So as soon as the user Rajesh is executing this command, the communication will happen from user speech to the command. So how it, again, it happens, right? How it happens, right? There is a concept something i'm just telling you a high level there's something concept known as an interrupts interrupts so we call it as a software interrupt so 
So as soon as you are running any command or any application, a software interrupt will call. That software interrupt is going to switch the execution from the user space to the kernel space. It will go to switch the execution. Switch the execution from user space to the kernel space. So when switch will happen, whenever this interrupt or the signal is getting, getting caught, who is calling the signal on interrupt? These commands. Whenever you're executing this command, the software interrupt will get generated. That software interrupt is going to switch the execution from the user space to the kernel space. And whenever a kernel completes its activity or whenever it completes its task of executing that command, it will switch back from the user space, from the kernel space back to the user space. So it's always, we call it as a context switching. We call it as a context switching will be keep happening. Context switching. These are all very technical word I'm saying guys. Context switching will happen in your, always it happens actually. We can even browse also. If you say go, Rajesh, go to the Google and just say, what is contact switching in OS or in Linux? Okay, contact switching operating system. They would have explained it, what context. Saving the context of state of running so that it can be restored later and loading the context of Right, context switching is referred to the process or method used by the system to man change the pro process from one mode state to other mode state. CP present in it, so it always switches from the context switches from. There are many things are there, guys. I need not to really tell all these things because this is a very beautiful con concept of how exactly the context which happen, how the interrupt happen, how the interrupt comes. In. Can you see here interrupts? Say context switching trigger. There are three different categories: context switch, interrupts, multitasking, user to kernel switch. See, right. So this is what I was saying actually. So there's always, whenever an interrupt occurs, can you see it? So whenever interrupt occurs, context switching automatically switches to the component of the hardware that can handle the interrupts more quickly, right? This is what they have explained pretty deeply. We need not to really go in detail, right? But yeah, if you're being a system program instead as a discussion, yeah, we will be learning all these things. But we are a DevOps engineer, right? We need not to really know all such things. Right, so this is what this is a context switch of the process actually. Okay, now, good. Okay, guys, so that's all, right, about the bash. So now, what is our next things, what we have to learn? So what is the time, guys? It is 10 o'clock, right? Uh, another half an hour, we'll be sitting. Or do we have to take five, 10 minutes break? We can take, I we can, uh, uh, I will be... Uh, uh, pausing the recording. Is it fine? If you want to take 10 minutes break? Yes, or, should I, or should I continue? <laughs> no, it will break is best. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will just uh, pause the recording. Okay, so guys, uh, uh, so we came from the break, right? So, okay, now what would be the next actually? Uh, we will revisit again. As I said, like many times we have to come across with these things because whenever I, I'm adding any new things uh, into this explanation, I have to uh, I have to draw the same diagram again and again and I have to explain you some extra things. So which is always required. We'll be learning in our upcoming sessions. But now what we will do now, we will try to learn about some commands actually. So we'll start, quick start working on Linux commands. Right, which is important. We have to know this. Many of you, I know very well that you already know Linux uh, commands very well. So what I would request that uh, you guys can contribute something, uh, like when I'm explaining something, if you are having any extra information, add into the class, it will be useful for others also. Or else I'll be asking you some questions, you need to answer me like that, right? So what we'll do, we will learn about what we're going to cover in 20 minutes. We'll learn some few commands, and also we will try to learn about like, how to create or seven different types of files. With this, we'll conclude today's session. Seven different types of files, right? So for us to work on Linux command, we should need a Linux. So let me quickly get into our AWS console. So let me go to the AWS console. So let me close all these things.
right? So we have this. So let me go to the console.aws.amazon.com. So this is the console where I will be uh, logging into my, so rajesh.devops.batch1, right? This is the account, right? New account which I created, right? So I'll just try to log into my account. So you know that, uh, so now you know that you are logged into the console homepage, but you could see that you are in the Northern Virginia region. So you can work here itself. Or else what you can do that you can switch to your Asia Pacific Mumbai, that is APFN South 1. And APFN South FN 1, this is not but the region code we say. So every region, there is a region code it's there. So you need to even remember the region code also. Right? If it is Asia Pacific Mumbai, if it is I've always APFN South FN 1. If it is a Singapore region, it is APFN South East FN 1. Like that, you should remember. If it is a Northern Virginia, it is US hyphen East hyphen one. Like that, you should remember. So, anyways, if, anyhow, if you start working more and more every day, right, you will automatically remember all these things. You need not to muck up. So, I'll get into the Asia Pacific region. So, if I get into it, let me go to the EC2 service because I need to launch the VM. <coughs> okay. So, I think I don't have any instance which is running. So I have to create it, right? You know very well how to create it now. So let me quickly do it and just watch what I'm doing it. If you have any doubts in between, you can ask me while doing it, right? So I'll just say launch instance. I'll just say something like uh, Linux VM, something. I'll just say Linux VM, Linux virtual machine VM. Come over here. I will select the Ubuntu and I will go with the 24.04, right? And I'll go with the t2.micro. So this is sufficient for me. Key pair, I don't have any key pair. Let me create a new key pair. So you can either do it here or you can just do a right click or you can just create a new key pair, right? Okay, something like a new key. Some can give some name as a new key. And you should always select PEM, not PPK file, right? PEM you create and then you try to do a create key. As soon as you create key, you could see that you have downloaded that key now, right? So now here what happened, you, it has been selected here. Come down here in the networking settings, go to the edit. Come over here, it has chosen some default VPC. Subnet, if you want something, can give the subnet. So I will give the subnet AP hyphen South hyphen one. This is subnet one. So I'll give this as a subnet one. I'll select. Always you have to select auto assign public IP as enable. If you if you choose disable, then what happens? The public IP address will not be assigned to the VM virtual machine. It should always be enabled. So suppose assume that whenever you're creating any kind of a server where, where it should have some private subnet or private IP address should be there, no public, then you have to disable it. So, but here in this case, since we have to log in, right, we need to enable it so that we'll get a public IP, right? And then you can go with the uh, security groups or the file. You can either create or use an existing uh, security group. I'll go to the existing only, select this, Choose the existing one. I have something like a my first uh, AG, right? On that day, we created last class, right? I will select this as a second group, right? Come down. Do you have to add any more things? Nothing. Just say launch instance. Right? Come here. Just say view all instance. <clears throat> so your VM is coming up here. So meanwhile, what I will do that, I will go to the, I'll go to my downloads and you could see that actually uh, you have a, uh, you have a PEM key. Let me remove this. I don't want to have this. PEM key is there. You know how to create a PPK file. You can just uh, do a put it in exe, right? You can launch it. Go to the key. Select this as a second version, right? And say OK. And then load it. All files, new PEM, open it. And then save as a private key. Yes. And then select all files, select this file name, instead of them, give it as a PPK. So this we have already discussed a lot, right, in the last session, right, and save the file. So you have created a file by name newkey.ppk file, right? So now we got this file, now go back here, and you could see that almost your virtual machine has come up now. So select this, go to the, copy the public IP address, go over here to the downloads, go to the putty exe, launch the putty exe. Now first you copy the IP over here in this in this bar actually. This IP address you can give either host name or the IP address. I'm giving this IP address. Now you have to do little settings over here because you are opening through putty configuration, right? Putty, you can you can do some settings or what kind of a settings you can do. Say for example, if you go to the terminal, so is there anything you want to set it? No. Keyboard, 
always uh, here also nothing if you go to the bell you make it as a none because when you're typing something you should not get any sound so you have to just say none it means that you have disabling any kind of a bell afterwards features nothing is there window here also you can scroll you can give some big number here like because you have to scroll a lot of output when you're getting terminal so number of lines of scroll back is some big number you can give it here right after that windows anything else is there nothing appearance you can go and you can change the font size suppose for example if i go to the change click on change you can make it bold you can make it as a 16 and you can even set the font uh, uh, you know like font which one you want either you courier b you want or else you want some other font one right you can give anything whichever you like it actually right you can give it so i am giving here as a courier new and then any other things is required nothing just say okay right behavior there is nothing much if translation nothing much color yes background setting colors default foreground you can set it right and under this communication you know that you have something like ssh you can just expand this ssh you can see that this is something something like auth expand it credentials so it is asking you to provide the credentials because we are using this uh, ppk file right ppk file you have to repoint this credential to that ppk file click on this select this new ppk and then say open so it has already been selected here and go back over here at the top and you could see that you have given the ip address right this is what some minimal settings you have to do or is what you can do that you can create your own session a new session where you already did all this default setting use that session always to launch your your to launch the putty session always so we'll do that also now in some time but right now you i'm just doing it manually later i will create one session i'll create where i'll do all the settings and i'll just use that settings or use that saved session uh, you know so that i will get all the default setting whatever i said so right now i have did everything because this linux what i've launched is a ubuntu linux right if you click on this here and then say connect right like this you could see that the default user with which you have to log in is Ubuntu. That itself is a name. Okay, it means that with this Ubuntu username and with this key, that is new key.ppk file, you can able to log into that server. Right? So what I will be doing that, I will go back here to my putty session. And now you could see that actually everything is there. I'll just say open. So accept the connection. Now it is asking you to provide the username. I know it's a Ubuntu. I'll just say Ubuntu and say enter. Now you could see that it has authenticated and it has logged into my system, right? So when you log into the system, guys, you could see something, it will come like this something. So what is this? This, we call it as a primary prompt. What is it? We call this as a primary prompt. Primary prompt is something like where it is showing you, it is telling who is a user who has logged into the system at after that, what is an IP address? This we call it as a host name. If I execute a command, who am I? You see, who is the user who has logged in, who is working? A Ubuntu user, user is the one who is logged in. So Ubuntu at the end, and this is what, this we call the host name. If I execute a command host name, can you see here? The host name. So whatever you're seeing here, this is nothing but the host name. So here in this case, guys, I have logged in as a Ubuntu user with along with that new key.ppk file. I've used this key as an authentication purpose because new PP, I'm using a putty to do everything, right? So you are logged in to a system or you are logging log in as a Ubuntu user. Here, Ubuntu user is a pseudo user. So in case of a Linux, actually, Pseudo user will always have roots permission. It means that whatever the root user can do, right? Even the pseudo user can also do. So whatever the major permissions where the root user has, right? Pseudo user also has it. So root user is something like he's a system admin. He's a super user. In case of Linux or in Unix, root user is a super user. Or he's a system admin with it. Now, now, in this case, in our case, guys, in our case, I'm logged in as a Ubuntu user. If I want to switch to the root user, then I have to say sudo su hyphen enter. Can you see? You have switched to the root user. 
So whenever you want to do a switch user, you have to use a command su. Su means switch user hyphen. Right? You want to go back to the Ubuntu, back to the normal user again, you have to say exit. Then you'll go back to your normal user root. Some people say sudo su hyphen i. Okay, su hyphen i, I think. No, no. Uh, or you say su switch user. You can also do a switch like this. Right? This is sudo su or su hyphen. It'll switch to the root user. Like that. So when you want to exit out, it'll say exit out. So what I'm saying is, as soon as you're logged in, you'll get this prompt actually. This will sim this we call it as a primary prompt. You can even change also if you need it. Suppose you say, Rajesh, I don't want this primary prompt like this. I want something like uh, um, something in my com company. I am the client 101. So it should show something like client 101 at the rate, right? Dev something dot quintra dot com like this i should get a prompt no problem you can set that so what you have to do that there is one tell variable is there by name ps1 so you can edit this ps1 tell variable to change the primary prompt we will do it later all the things right so PS1 is not but the special shell variables. What is this variable? Again, we'll come across later. But right now, I understand that there is some variable is that PS1 where you need to do the changes to change this uh, primary prompt. Suppose I want to change to this name, whatever the currently which is exist, right? I want to change from Ubuntu or the right something to this prompt. Then you can change or you can update this PS1 variable, right? Something like you can just say like some. Can you see that PS1 is e PS1 is equal to client hundred at the rate dev.quintra.com. This will temporarily do it. Can you see it? Have you seen that? See, you have changed now. Correct? Sir, I have a doubt. Hmm. Uh, host name will also do the same job, right? Host name, CTL. Host name will only show this one, man. It will only change this one. It will not change this one. Oh, you wouldn't okay. do other. Here, what happened at username also, I can change it. Okay, okay. So you're just setting the PS1 to some value. This is a temporary. I want to make it permanent. Means there is one configuration file. Is there where you have to go and edit it? Okay. That will become permanent. So in the companies and all, you could see that when you log in, you won't get prompts like this. You'll get prompts like something like this, like this client hundred or dev. Which also you log in, right? It'll show something like this. Right. In my company, right? Whenever I used to log in, right? They used to, I used to get like this. A80392 at the rate, right? Uh, something like dev dot or test one dot quintra dot com like this I used to get it whenever I log in like this I used to always get like this I used to always get like this so if you are test to miss test to server this will be the common this is my username like that same thing here the username is Ubuntu so when I used to execute who am I right it used to show me a eight zero three nine two like that it is showing Ubuntu here but it used to show a eight zero three nine two it means that I have logged into this like that. So they have edited this PS1 variable to make do all these changes actually. Is it clear? This Ubuntu user uh, had made the entry in sudo files. Hmm? Ubuntu user. He's a sudo. He's a sudo user actually. Yes. Yeah. Where we to check uh, Ubuntu is a sudo or not? Yes, I will tell you all those things later. Don't worry. Now currently I understand that Ubuntu is a sudo user now, which I have logged in. He is a sudo user. So there's a sudo file is there through that you can also see that Ubuntu is acting like a sudo users. Okay. Now we we get back to the same prompt where we are earlier. So we learned something. Who am I? Host name is something like it will show the system name or the host name. Right. So host name is also important because you can represent any uh, any server either with the host name or either with the IP address. Right. IP address we know very well. Right. If you execute the IP if config command, if config command, you will get an IP address. So here you could see that uh, you don't have that command, so you have to install it. You could see that there, it is saying that you please install a net hyphen tool package to get this command. So this is a command. We will see what this command is later, understand it later, but right now we will try to execute this command. So first I will just say sudo apt update. 
So apt is a command which is used for in case of a Debian distribution. So since Ubuntu is a Debian distribution, Ubuntu is Debian distribution, we need to use the apt command to update the system, install or uninstall any kind of a packages, any packages or software. Apart from this uh, APT, even we have some of the DPKG command is also there. That command is also used to install the packages in Ubuntu. Okay, so here, I have to first always run a sudo apt update. Later, I'll be updating that sudo apt install net hyphen tool. So let me update it. So why this is doing, I will tell you in sometimes, not now, but try to understand that you are updating your package repository. The package repo you're updating to the latest what is available, and then you will install sudo apt install net hyphen tools package. So, if I, so now the update is completed, right? It says that actually it is done, uh, and then the friend says that 25 packages have been upgraded. You can even run this command to upgrade it. Okay, later we will see that. Don't worry because there's a separate uh, topic I will take on apt that we will be seeing. And uh, when I want to install the net tools, I have to use a sudo apt install net hyphen tools package. Like this. This is a package I will be installing. If you install this package, you will get a command by name if config. So when you install this package, as part of this, you will get a command by name if config. Earlier you used to get a, a message saying that when I execute the if config command, what what message I got? It says a command not found. But you can install with this with this command. It's saying so it didn't found this command because this package was not installed. Now I have installed it. Now I can, if I execute the if config command, it will show you the it will show the output and you could see that this is your IP address. In my case, this is the IP address of this system, right? So what is it? If config, this is the output of if config. In case of your uh, Windows, if I open the terminal here like this, so I can run a command by name IP config. Right? If I use IP config, it will show you my IP address. Can you see 192.1c.0.17, 117, sorry, this is the IP address of my machine. Right, some people will also execute like this: IP config slash all, all the available interface, network interface, everything it will show <clears throat> like this. Same thing, whatever the IP config, uh, all we are running. Right, similarly in Linux we are running a if config command. Both are same. Right, so it will show you the output something like what are the interfaces you have. In this case, E and X zero, that's an interface. And one more interface is a loopback, hello, loopback we say. And here it could see that this is the IPv4 IP address, net mask, broadcast IP address, IPv6 address, right? How many number of packets are, have been sent? How many number of packets have been translated? How many has been error? How many has been dropped, right? What is MTU, maximum transfer unit, 9001? It means that whenever you're transferring any packet in this inter network interface, the maximum number of bytes you can transfer in a single packet is 9000 bytes. You can transfer. So this is a very huge number. Nowadays, you are getting a packet size which are more than 9K, 9000 bytes. So 9000 is huge actually. So through this interface, so this we call it as a network interface like this. Similarly, like you have a loopback interface and we are having an IP address like 127.0.0.1. Right? You would have seen some people in uh, in the t-shirts, they will put this number 127.0.0.1. No phone, no IP address found. Because this loopback is something it will not point to anything. It will point to itself actually. So now what happened, right? Whenever you are having a network stack in your operating system, how you can prove that it is having network stack in an operating system means you have to just ping to this IP address. If you ping to this IP address like this, it will ping to itself. It will try to ping to itself. If it pings to itself, it means that there is a network stack available in your operating system. This is a very, very basic fundamental question on networking. Somebody asked in an interview, how do you prove that networking is there in your system? 
you will say, sir, I will work, I will execute if config command. They will say that if config is not working, assume that the command is not installed or the package is not installed. Still, how you will do? Uh, sir, I will say IP ADDR. This is also there. This will also give me the IP address so that through this, I will be able to get to know. Fine. But how you are going to prove that networking is there or not in your system? Whether the network stack is installed or enabled or not in the system, you will just say that, sir, always I will try to do a ping to my loopback address. If I say ping 127.0.0.0, if it pings, it means the networking is enabled in my system. Simple. That is a very basic answer. Uh, you have to give it actually to the interviewer, right? Then that he, he will understand. Okay, your network concept is clear. Clear, guys. So what we did, right? Today we tried to learn some command. We started just started learning some commands. Like we executed some commands. Like right? what are the commands? Who am I? Uh, command and we try to know about the host name command and also we try to know about the if config command apart from this there is something as ip space addr even with this command also you can get the ip address of the system sometime what happened right when you're working on some customized uh, say for example you're working on a docker image right docker image and all it will not come with all the commands if config command you will not find in some docker images then in that case this command you have to execute to check the ip address of your docker image so if the Docker image, image is a Ubuntu image, you have to execute this IP ADR so that you will be able to see what is the IP address of that system. Right? And also we saw something like a PS1 prompt or something like that. Right? Is it clear, guys? So now, if you go to the diagram, as per this diagram, and if here what happened, Ubuntu user, and he is sitting here, and he is running some command. Like what command? All these commands. Whatever you said, Rajesh, whatever you are saying now, all these commands, whatever you execute the commands, all these commands are executed by the Ubuntu user. So whether the when he's executed, when the Ubuntu user, who's a pseudo user, when he's executing all those commands, like host name, IP ADDR, if config command, the communication is happening from the user space to current space. And how it is happening? You are because your bash shell is creating an environment. The bash shell will create an environment to execute that command or the application program. So Rajesh, whether the context which is actually happening with the help of a shell, yes. The context which is actually happening with the help of a shell. Who is executing your commands or the application? Your bash shell is executing the command on behalf of a user. While executing the command, the control will go to the kernel space and kernel will start executing the command on behalf of a user or on behalf of a shell. Shell will doesn't do itself. Shell will never execute any task. It doesn't do any other way. It will just try to translate it to the kernel space. Or will try, try, try to translate to the kernel. That's all it is. Is it clear, guys? So I hope that we learned something today and we have to continue working on the command. So tomorrow's agenda would be tomorrow agenda we will be learning a lot of commands. Like I think I'll be covering some 15 to 20 commands tomorrow. And we have to learn some editors. The most famous editor is the VI editor, we see. And also some companies use even nano editor. So we will take that which are the most famous editor and why we have to use these editors. So this is our, this will take hardly will take 15, 20 minutes of the time to learn the editor. As well as there is a VI tutorial is also there online where you can practice it. But but because most of you already know Linux very well, I don't think that it will be difficult for you to uh, work on VHS because you already know, right? You've been using it actually. So anyhow, but there are many other people are there in a the group who are very new to it, but we have to showcase for them also. that what are this VHS or Dynavator, how we use it, why we use it, all those things we'll discuss. What are the different modes are there in the editor and what are the different features this editor provides, right? And all the shortcuts related to the VHS also, we have to discuss it. So learning commands, editors, right? As well as learning about bash features, something, bash shell features, also we need to learn. So this would more or less, this would be our agendas of tomorrow's session. And also I will see that how to write the first program in Linux and execute it as well how to write first bash shell script and execute it. This is what you will be 
concluding at the end. And also, like, I'll also be uh, explaining about, like, different types of files. Different types of files exist in Linux. So these are some important things, guys, which we need to uh, in understand in tomorrow's session. Is it clear? Yeah, clear. So, guys, any doubts we have <clears throat> till now, so far? So far, have you understood today's session, guys? So, from now, what we'll be doing that we will be only doing practicals. It means that we'll be launching the Linux VM and we will be executing some commands. So, what I will do tomorrow, I will, I, anyhow, I will terminate now, terminate it now. So, one more thing, guys, whenever you work on a Linux system, have once you are completed Linux system, because this will be per hour basis, it means that every hour there is a billing for this. Since you are under the free trial, it means that I recently created this account, I will get a per month, I will get a 700 hours of. Uh, using the Linux system, uh, Linux system, and if it is a T2 dot micro, it is a free. It will be the no charge. Will be the 700, 700 hours. You can make it, make it up actually. So, but I need not to use it because it's per hour. Now, just you could see that 15 minutes back, I launched this server, right? But it will almost it will be built for one one hour. It will take for one hour. So, out of the 700 hours, like one hour is detected now. So, I'm remaining with the six 699 hours. So, suppose if I'm launching some four servers. I'm running for four hours. For four hours, four hours will be detected out of the 700 hours. So every month you will get around 700 hours of hour of uh, uh, no, uh, runtime for each and every VM. And that too, that instance type should be uh, under the free trial eligible. If it is not t2.micro, if it is t2.medium or t2.large, then it is chargeable. Then you will get a monthly bill. Or else if you're using any kind of a free trial, then you will not get any bill. So always make sure that you use under the free trial so that there is zero billing you'll get. And also you'll be able to practice all your Linux concepts very well. Right? So don't choose, apart from this micro, don't choose any other instance type while creating it because it will charge you. Is it clear? And once it is done, guys, please make a habit of always clicking on this. Go to the instance state and just say, Terminate the instance. Don't stop it also. If you stop also, you'll get the billing. So that's the reason. Don't stop it. Just say terminate the instance. Because again, you're practicing tomorrow. You have to again launch a new server. And then you have to do the same operation. It will hardly take around two, three minutes to launch an instance. Right? Or else tomorrow we'll see. Suppose if I write any script, or write something like I can write a script and I can call that script to create it actually. So even, even you can run a script. You can auto, means basically have to write a Python script where you have to start an instance and then like uh, whenever you don't want it, you can terminate that instead. So just run a Python script. So for that, what I have to do that? So for that, what we will do that? Simple. I need to install Python in my system, in my Windows. I need to install Python in my Windows means in my laptop I want to install. Python need to be installed. Right? And afterwards, what will happen, right? Installed and then like we have a Boto3 library, you have to install Boto3 package, you have to install it. After that, you need to write a Python script. And before that, what you have to do that, you need to do, you have to create an IAM user in, in case of your AWS, configure everything. That means that in your system, you should install the AWS CLI. AWS CLI, you have to install it. You have to install it. And then configure an IAM user in your AWS and configure it with the help of AWS CLI, right? Configure everything and then finally write a Python script. So using the Boto3 library you, with the Python, press Boto3 library, right? Press, you need to write a Python script. So what it will do together, it will try to create an instance. You can create a new instance. New instance in AP hyphen south hyphen one region, you can create a Ubuntu server. You can create a Ubuntu server which which runs on the T2 dot which runs on T2 dot micro. This we can do a small exercise tomorrow to show you. This is automated. Why I have to always log into the console, go here, launch instance, do all those things. Can't I write a Python script and do it? Yeah, you can do it actually. Is it clear? So that you will see that the way you will be running. Similarly, you can write one more script, one more Python script. 
right? Where what happened, or else the existing only you can modify it where you can actually terminate that instance after you completed the work, right? So this is some automation we can do through Python. So it's just hardly three, four lines. You have to import the Boto3 library and then call the uh, instance uh, client underscore instance and this call that you, uh, that uh, uh, start underscore instance that you have to call that uh, function in your uh, Python script to just to invoke or just to create a VM actually and pass that image ID, whatever you are having the AM ID, right? That you need to pass so that it will create it automatically under the t2.micro. So we like three, four lines of code. That's all not much actually. So this all this installation, everything I'll show tomorrow. And then we'll write a script to launch the instance. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the terminal. Also, you can write a one small thing and then like you can commit. Is it clear, guys? Through Python, Rajesh? Yes, through Python script. One. That's what I'm saying. Why oh. uh, why Python is so much? Because that you need to automate all the tasks, right? I cannot log in every time the, to the console, right? Sometimes you'll not even get a console access also. Mm-hmm. In the industry, so you have to de purely depend upon the AWS CLI. Is AWS CLI? So it means that you have to work with some AWS CLI commands. But along with that, you can even write because if you're good at Python, you know that Python is used used to do automation. You can write Python, but how Python can actually connect with your AWS account and do it? Because in AWS, you already configured all the uh, like uh, with the help of an IAM user, you already configured everything. So what is IAM user and all? We'll discuss it. Once that is done, with the help of a Boto3 library, you can able to communicate to your AWS with the help of a Python script. So with the help of a Boto3 library, you can connect to your AWS and you can run some task by writing a Python script. So when you have written a Python script, when you try to run it, it needs that Boto3 library. So Boto3 library, what it'll do, a package will do that. It'll try to connect to your AWS account and then whatever you are written the code in the Python, it will try to run over there actually. So once we run it, actually, what happened? Whatever is the task you have to achieve, say, for example, you have to create a new server, it will create it. It will go to the EC2 instance that will create it. Something like that in AWS, we have something like a cloud formation templates. You can write a cloud formation templates. You can create an AWS EC2, right? Uh, and you can do it. So for example, if you go over here, see, AWS EC2 commands. <clears throat> AWS EC2 commands. This is nothing but AWS EC2 commands. Yes, you'll be using this. This is used for creating a virtual machine. Where is it, man? Create an image, create an image like this. Create an instance. Where is it? Create underscore instance. Create a launch template. Create an image. So it's like this. These are some, these are the commands which you'll be using. Like this. How to do it? You if you come down, they have given an example of how to do how to do it actually. Or if they are not given a command. You can click on that. You can go it. For example, here I will explain you all these things in tomorrow. I mean, in upcoming sessions, we will be learning that. This is something like an automation. We'll be doing everything through the Python actually, and this is what we have to learn actually. Clear, guys? So I hope that you we just started with Linux today. Tomorrow we'll uh, deep dive into a lot of commands and many things we'll be learning tomorrow. It will be very interesting uh, session tomorrow because we'll be learning a lot of concepts on Bash shell. Bash itself and uh, commands and many uh, uh, interesting information about uh, about the different types of files. What why we created? Why we have so much different types of files? Again, deep dive into something with the file systems. So what is file system is all about? Why we need a file system? So there are a lot of things are there to learn. Uh, so we will be covering all those things in one or two days. Next one or two days, and then we will get into the scripting part. Clear? So okay, guys. So I think uh, we have done for today's uh, thing uh, today's session and any doubts you have any questions you have so far okay abhishek is there narendra kumar uh, at least uh, you told earlier that 24th you will be not available yeah i will not be available said but uh, tomorrow I, i'll be joining because i will be back by home by max by 6 actually okay no issue so because my uh, event will complete by 3.30. So Aram say in two hours, I can come back home. So tomorrow, I'm not canceling. I have to take it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks for asking it, actually. Uh, Shivam Bhai, uh, Abhishek, Anurag, Ashish, Gaurav, Sandeep. Farin, did you understood whatever we discussed? Yes, yes, Ajish. Yes, Ajish. 
यशार भाई एनी क्वेश्चन यू हैव नो थैंक्स श्योर थैंक यू देन आई थिंक मोस्ट ऑफ यू अंडरस्टूड टूडे सेशन सो थैंक यू फॉर अटेंडिंग टूडे सेशन बाय एंड आई बी शेयरिंग दिस रिकॉर्डिंग गाइस विथ यू ऑल उंट and when launch instance right we yeah. create a, we select this ubuntu and we select this ami image ubuntu server 24.04 right this okay. image itself has a sudo user default inbuilt user known as a ubuntu okay so when you launch it you will get by default you get the ubuntu it means that you have to log into that uh, system or the server by using a ubuntu only similarly if i am launching with the amazon linux the default user for amazon linux is ec2 hyphen user Okay. For Amazon Linux, it is EC2. This is he is a user, default user, and he and this EC2 user is also pseudo user. Okay. Same thing with the Red Hat Linux, RHL, RHL nine or RHL eight, whatever you write. The default user is EC2 user. With that user only, you have to log into the Red Hat machine. Okay. And that EC2 user again, he is a pseudo user. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, guys. Chalo then. I think uh, we are done with today, and we'll see tomorrow then. Tomorrow, sharp at eight thirty, we will join, and then we will continue our discussion. Okay. Thank you all then. Bye bye. Good night. Okay. Bye. Good night. Let me stop the recording. Thank you, Rajesh.